Ladies and gentlemen, we got 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 I have earned everything. <laughs> I can see Russia from my house. <laughs> Ask not what your country yeah, can. Good. <laughs> okay. Uh, what's the? What's the? It's your favorite president. <laughs> <laughs> Don't say well a lot. Um, <laughs> welcome. 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 Thank you all for listening to Chicken in Every Pod. Our show about American history and politics. <laughs> yeah. No, not... Our, every every episode That's we, go, awful. we go minute by minute through American History X. A film I've never seen. A film I have seen. I'm sorry. It's not, it's fine. Um we uh, are back after a week long hiatus. Yeah, we took a little hiate. Um because we had a busy I weekend. hate that. I hate I hate I hiate to let the fans down. Um, we Thank just had a busy, fans. busy weekend. We got uh, Lucia's mom her second vaccine dose. Woo, woo. It took re- like five seconds. It was, it was super great. efficient. We went to Magic Mountain for that, not on a separate trip. Yeah. Um, and we uh, really rode the ride of medical technology. That's right. We rode the ride of 2020. <laughs> Am I right? Oh, um, Dumpster. And wow. yeah, and I've been, uh, I've had a lot of lesson planning to do. So we took a little hiatus. And now we are back. Yeah, and I've got our book we've been doing some reading from, Yankee Doodle Dandies, A Star-Spangled Satire. Oh, great, great. From 1976. Yeah. Our, starring me. our fumbling founding fathers. Banned in the original 13 colonies. Starring the original O-Bunglers. The original O-Bunglers. <laughs> so this page, so uh, it's kind of like a little comic, so it, it, it's not as much knock-knock jokes, even though these books usually were. So this is uh, people reading... Um, the Declaration of Independence. I'm closing my eyes and picturing it. The Continental it. Congress. I hate it. It's nothing more than a bunch of sentimental hogwash. It stinks to high heaven. My five-year-old could have done better. I say it's a literary triumph. Jefferson has written 1,817 words of sheer brilliance. Then Benjamin Franklin's like, Personally, I've made it a rule whenever in my power to avoid becoming the draftsman of a paper to be reviewed by a public body. It can only result in heartache and hard feelings. And Jefferson's holding his head like, now you tell me. (laughs) That's it? That's the whole comic? That's that little (laughs) That's great. That's satisfying. Satire. Rise it fine. It's just funny, it's man. It's just funny because it's, it's true. It's funny. It's funny because it's true. <laughs> um. So you know, we. It, it is the final day of February, my birthday month, and wow. more importantly, Black History Month. Um, and you know, I I wish that we had focused more on some um, amazing stories in Black history. Uh, it it was a it, it's been a month. So, um, you know, but the thing is, we are very uh, determined to, you know, live every day like it's Black History Month (laughs) and keep keep telling stories, um, you know, uh, because they, uh, you know, Black Americans and uh, are a a big part of the American tale. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. Um, And the current American tale. So it's not like, um, you know, it's not like. Well, well, we missed our window. <laughs> um, uh, so, but we're excited about today's story. Um, today's stories. Stories, yeah. I just meant the, the figure for, that we're focusing well, on. Well, we're going to focus on another two. Because we're going to talk about the history of Black History Month. I know, I was going to ask you, but first, tell me about Black well, History Month. Well, I was going to say, there is a person we'll be talking about with it. Wow. That was my intro More to More than you. one human will become brought up in this conversation. Okay. That's crazy. Okay. Okay. I'm, I'm trying to introduce our, our first half of our topic, and I'm getting roasted. Yeah, I'm just going to roast you like a pig on its bit. Okay. All right. Well, in exchange for that, mm-hmm. I'm going to do your least favorite thing, and I'm going to ask you some if you know some stuff. Shit. So, Lucia 
Do you know how long Black History Month has been celebrated in the United States? I don't know. I feel like I feel like it got chosen for February because of Martin Luther King Day, and I feel like that had to be have been done a little while after our own government assassinated him. Yeah. Bzz, wrong-o. It is not because of Martin Fuck Luther you. King. Fuck <laughs> you. <Bzz>, wrong-o. <laughs> it's, so it began as uh, Black History Week, mm-hmm. or in the parlance of the year, mm-hmm. Negro History Week, 1926. Mm-hmm. I, I did want to interject with our friend Brandy Grace, whose birthday is today, actually. Um, oh, yeah. Assembly candidate Brandy Grace uh, in California she posted that uh, she asked her son, like, who, like, President's Day, like, you know, like, whose birthday is it today? Like, on President's Day or something. She's like, his her, like, little toddler son was like, Martin Luther King. <laughs> like, President Martin Luther King. We should just <laughs> pretend he was a president. Um, yeah, that would be better. I mean, because our government does assassinate our own presidents, too. So. Yeah, he got, he, got, he got the buku 1960s president treatment. Okay, so okay. back to the parlance of when so, said, yeah. Carter G. Woodson was a historian. Mm-hmm. He was a black historian. Mm-hmm. The second person ever to get a PhD, second black person ever oh to get a PhD from Harvard after W. B. Du Bois, which he pronounced his last name Du Bois. I always have to remind myself because I want to read it as Du Bois. But he pronounced it Du Bois, so... W.B. Du Bois. So we will pronounce it Du Bois. Du Bois. It, it should be Du Bois. Du Bois on Amazon Prime. <laughs> hey, good show. So... <laughs> uh, W.B. is not where you watch Du Bois. I'm right. very sorry. He's an all important right. man. Right. Okay. So, yeah, we should do a whole episode on Du Bois, actually. He's great. Mm-hmm. Um, so, Carter G. Woodson had, had a group called the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History in the when? 1920s. 20s? Yeah. Uh, he was a historian, and the point of this group was to promote the teaching of black history. And so, in uh, 1926, he announced that the second week of February would be Negro History Week. And He the, just made that choice. That's yeah, awesome. He just said, like, I'm an educator, I'm a historian. And originally the idea was that it would be mostly for education. Mm-hmm. That school, at first universities within schools, would take this time to specifically highlight black history in their curriculum. That Where was, was he based? Like, Boston? Uh, yeah, it doesn't say. Um, his organization was from Chicago. So, I'm guessing, yeah, one of those big cities. Okay. Um, it was a national thing, though. Like, cool. it was supposed to be a national initiative. And the second week was chosen because Abraham Lincoln's birthday is February 12th, mm-hmm. as we know. And Frederick Douglass is February 20th. Um, and so, he wanted to honor those two figures. Mm-hmm. And that's why it was the second week of February. Um, Hell yeah. And I have the same birthday as Langston Hughes, February 1st. That's true. A lot of Februarys. Um, Yeah, so the idea was originally to coordinate teaching of black history uh, in public schools. And um, at first, it didn't work. Didn't catch on. Yeah, like, it got got some okay responses, but the only places really that went along with the idea were the Department of Education in North Carolina, Delaware, and West Virginia. Wow. And the uh, city school administrations of Baltimore and D.C. Pretty much everywhere else was like, yeah, I don't even worry about that so much. Um, but they just kept doing it, basically. Every every week, every year, he kept promoting it and publishing things about it in, this, in the journal that he published, the Journal of Negro History. And by 1929... With only two exceptions, which doesn't say what they are, every state with a considerable black population had made the event known to the state's teachers and distributed official literature. This is so fucking cool. And it's funny because, you know, as a uh, white person growing up in Los Angeles, Black History Month was super uh, important. Yeah. And, um, like, those lessons were some of my favorites. And, you know, um, we also learned about, like, you know, black inventors, like the guy that invented the traffic light and stuff. Um, so it, it was a it was a really awesome time, and part of what made it awesome was like, hey, why the fuck aren't we learning these stories throughout the rest of the yeah, year? Yeah, exactly. And then, but it's funny because it's like, just this just this guy is so interesting. Yeah, that he just it's decided like, like, why didn't we learn about him? And he was, you know, his parents were slaves. Like, shit. 
yeah, it was he just decided to make it happen. So he also <laughs> made a uh, problematic comparison where he basically said, like, why are we doing this? Well, a culture needs a, a history and, and traditions or else it gets forgotten. And he said, like, think of Native Americans. They didn't record their history, and now they're gone. But look <laughs> at Jews. They love recording their history, and they're very prominent. Okay, Carter, you're canceled. <laughs> yeah, it's like, okay, buddy, hold up, hold up, Dr. Woodson. Um, no, I, get, I, I get what he meant. So it grew in popularity <laughs> um, throughout the 30s, in part as a response to the uh, popularity of the book and movie Gone with the Wind, mm. which was seen as promoting the lost cause narrative of the Civil War. Mm. The idea that it was a noble cause on some level and a noble life that was destroyed. And so because that was such a huge thing, because the book was 1936, the movie was 1939, mm-hmm. because that's such a huge thing, more and more educators started pushing what was at the time Negro History Week as the counter to that. Yeah. To teach the truth of slavery and of the... Uh, and reconstruction that whole experience that's so interesting um i mean i guess it did sort of i mean because people think of gone with the wind as the same as um what's the movie the birth of a nation birth of a nation yeah when it's not no um and you it's know, a much more it involved yeah you know um the actress who played mammy like going to the oscars and stuff and it you know and the fact that a lot of people in hollywood didn't want her to go and yeah. you know it did start a lot of conversations and i feel like it was the first time in the 20th century that the civil war which was still in recent memory living just memory yeah. living memory to some people that it was like there was there were obviously hollywood movies that were romanticizing it but this was like a huge national like suddenly everyone's talking about it yeah i feel like almost the way schindler's list was like brought back the national conversation about the holocaust mm. um like where it was just suddenly like everyone's talking about it yeah Um, And so that's interesting to think of, like, you know, it's, for better or worse, it was starting a lot of conversations, and um, it was just so, in on, you know, in everybody's, it was such a huge movie that it was in everyone's mind. I've still never seen it. I know. Isn't that weird? Yeah, it is. Continue. Um, And so, as it grew in popularity over the next couple of decades... A bunch of mayors started making it a holiday, basically. A bunch of horses? Yeah, a bunch of nayers, yeah. I didn't Um, say nayers, I meant like a mare is like a male horse. Oh, I think it's meant the nays. A bunch of... (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I didn't think of mare. I thought of one who nays, like a horse. A bunch of naysayers, (laughs) that's what I always call my horses. (laughs) Oh, you're such a naysayer, saying that's your horse. Mine's a haysayer, because he's always like, feed me hay. (laughs) Nays Mr. Red, he speaks. Um... Okay, so this goes on for a few, a few, uh, a few decades, mm-hmm. and then the uh, Black United Students and a group of Black educators at Kent State in 1969, they before or after the Kent the Kent State, State shooting. Uh, I actually don't. No, I think it's after, but or no, I think it's actually right before. Let me let me double check. So some professors. It's about a year before. Wow, I mean, because if you remember, if you look up stuff about Kent State. It was basically the professors that saved a lot of the kids from more fatalities because yeah. they literally put their bodies on the line to bring the kids into the the students into the uh, into back into the classrooms and be like, get the fuck out of here! Like they're shooting us and yeah, it's just shit. It's just heavy. Um, we should do a whole Kent State episode. Yeah, uh, we were just talking about how Mark Mothersbaugh of Devo, great band. he and the members of Devo were at Kent State as students. Yeah, and yeah. that's what the Kent State Massacre is what inspired them of like fuck it we're starting a band it's called Devo because of de-evolution de- de- de-evolution yeah cause because the society's cratering yeah. like everyone's getting worse um, um anyway, Kent State pretty badass crazy so so, back, so they propose year before, so they propose a Black History Month 1969 yeah nice February of 1969 nice um and the first Black History Month did take place at Kent State the next year so about two months before the Kent State shootings. Fuck. So Kent State was in maybe in the national memory, like this really liberal. It was a very prominent place. Very yeah. prominent. Oh like, yeah. Oh, that's where those war those. It's like Midwestern Berkeley. 
Yeah, Midwestern yeah. Berkeley. Okay. Um, and so, yeah, so February of 1970 is the first celebration of Black History Month at Kent State University. It's good to know there was a reason for February that wasn't, like, when people say, like, why'd you give us the shortest month in the year? Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. good to know that it's like, no, there was a reason. There's, there's a reason. I mean, Abraham Lincoln and Frederick Douglass, I think, are in the running for two of the greatest Americans that ever lived. Yeah. You know, to, to cement it around those birthdays. Makes sense. Yeah, so and MLK was born in late January, so I think they just kind of folded in. Yeah, I think that's the case. So, uh, in 1976, six years later, uh, for the bicentennial... <laughs> uh, they celebrate all the bison. Yeah, that's... Yeah, that uh, they John, killed in America. John Tenniel, who did the illustrations for Alice in Wonderland, and all the bisons. They combined to... Wow, we have a lot of useless facts in Yeah, we, we need to go outside again. Um... <laughs> So Gerald Ford recognized Black History Month in 1976 as part of the Bicentennial. He's the first president to basically proclaim it a national thing. Wow. And the Bicentennial, of course, for those who don't know about the Bison and John Tenniel, uh, it was the 200-year anniversary of the founding of the United States mm-hmm. in 1976. Like we Spirit... talked about in the book that we read at the beginning. Yeah, well, we, talked, we talked about it. Uh... Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, we talked about the Bicentennial when we first introduced the book. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Spirit of 76, everywhere. Everybody loved it. So... Uh, Gerald Ford urged Americans to, quote, seize the opportunity to honor the too often neglected accomplishments of black Americans in every area of endeavor throughout our history. Surprising to come from Gerald Ford. Well, okay. he's, he's a full, of, full of mystery. He was. On the one hand, he helped cover up the fact that the government killed John F. Kennedy. On the other hand, he pardoned Richard Nixon. <laughs> On the other hand, he was a and model, right? And he also right? said a nice thing about black people once. <laughs> Um, he was a model. He was a model and a college football player. Um, he was a jock. Yeah. He was a jock. Jock strap. Um, and that's pretty much when the modern structure of Black History Month came into being. It was the month of February. It was not just for educators. It was about culture-wide recognizing the achievements and accomplishments of black Americans. Now, obviously at the time, and, and for quite a while afterwards, the reaction in the black community was such as it is was very positive Mm -hmm. right it was like great we're getting recognized that's fucking awesome there were some strong pushbacks push pushes back in the black community yeah Mm -hmm. which were mostly centered around what you what we've already referenced which is we should be celebrating black history all year round yeah you know uh, black americans there's a strong argument to be made that the black american story is the american story Exactly. Um, and so to relegate it to one month can feel condescending. It's interesting to think of um, asking your parents or your grandparents, like, do you remember Black History Month in school? And it does kind of explain why to boomers and beyond, they have this idea of like, uh, to white boomers. Yeah. Um, there's this idea of like, uh, well, everyone should be more like Martin Luther King or Rosa Parks. But then when it comes to... Um, you know, any other civil disobedience or Black Lives Matter, it's like they're doing it wrong. And it's like, yeah. if you think that from the 70s and on, they were fed a very specific story of Black history just like we have, then yeah. it's like, there's the, you know, the good trouble and the bad trouble, etc. Exactly. To reference um, good trouble. Yeah. What's that from? It's uh, John Lewis's right, John Lewis. coined phrase, which... I saw recently a police department. Was, yeah, that's what I. Yeah. Yeah, police department. Like the other day, <laughs> was trying to like march for police like awareness. Isn't and the point of police? They to were avoid... reclaiming good trouble. They're like, we're the good. Tr-. Like, Isn't the point of police no, no, no. to not have any trouble? Yeah. Isn't that like the job? Like the point of good trouble is stuff that the police may not like, but it's good. Yeah, like, exactly. That's what good trouble like, is. Break the law for for justice. Civil disobedience. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. If the law is unjust, it's just to break it. Exactly. Um. That's so yeah. psychotic. And so John Lewis, a uh, civil rights leader, senator, representative, representative, congressman, yeah, congressman, representative, and comic book author. That's right. Which is yeah, very cool. So you can read his biography, his autobiography. A, uh, and he passed away. Uh, yeah, so. and a, a true, a true great American. I know that there was complaints about some of his conduct with the Democratic Party later in his life, but in the face of his career, mm-hmm. in the face of his contributions. None of that really matters. Yeah. Uh, a great American. So, the United States is not the only country to celebrate Black History Month. Wow. Did you know that? Now I do. Wow. That's, <laughs> that's education, baby. Do I know what countries? No. Well, I'm going to ask you to guess. 
There's four other countries. No, that don't recognize ask. It. No. Yes. No, just tell me. <laughs> I'll kill you. It's, <laughs> well, I mean, it's, it's a lot of I the ones. I don't know the names of countries. It's a lot of the ones you'd expect. The first one besides the U. <laughs> what? I have no idea what I would expect. Well, that's why I'm going to explain them okay. and then you'll get it. Okay. The first one after the United States to proclaim it was the United Kingdom. Okay, good. In 1987, uh, October 1987 is when the UK does theirs. Uh, the reason was, and the reason why it started in 1987, it was the 150th anniversary of Caribbean emancipation Shit. from the UK. Um, which, you know, uh, our, the, the American experience with emancipated black Americans is largely based, obviously, around the social plantation system. The UK is, is largely based around the Caribbean, mm -hmm. which they owned until then. Um, it was also the centenary of the birth of Marcus Garvey. Do you know who Marcus Garvey was? I forget. So he was uh, Jamaican, mm -hmm. and he was a, a, an activist and, and organizer, a very controversial one. Mm -hmm. He was a, a pan-Africanist and a black nationalist, wow. so he basically wanted to create a, an African nation. He wanted everyone to go back. He was a leader of the Back to Africa movement. Okay. A place he never visited in his entire life. Oh my god! Um, and no one ever got him like a trip. He did proclaim himself pro provisional president of Africa. Um, hey, you can't do that. <laughs> so he was a black separatist, and he actually he was like Ruth Conda forever. Yeah, he was, um, and he actually worked with the KKK <laughs> because they were like, "Hey, we agree. We have similar right." Okay. Um, which is why he and uh, W. B. Du Bois, Du Bois, he Du Bois, why he and W. B. Du Bois were at loggerheads through a lot of their careers because they were in the same time, early yeah, 20th so century. Yeah, so I was like, "What are you doing, man?" He's like, <laughs> "Trust me, um, it's all gonna work out." Garveyism, which is what his philosophy uh -huh. was called, which was basically that kind of uh, pan-Africanist, black nationalist mm -hmm. perspective, was a big influence on Rastafari. Mm -hmm. It was a big influence on the Nation of Islam. And a lot of the black power movement. What is the show that we just watched? The Vice show about racism. Hate Thy Neighbor? Hate Thy Neighbor. Strong recommend. I'm sure you can watch some of it on Hulu it's or on, um, on YouTube, etc. Uh, uh, where this British host who's mixed race goes to different parts of the world and studies their racism and their racist groups. And he hangs out with like their hate groups. Yeah, so what's the group he hangs out with? They're not the Rastafari. It, no, it's the I think I think he hangs out with the black Israelites. He hangs out with the black Israelites yeah. and it's so fascinating because so much of what they say is true about uh, you know, white people oppressing them. But then and he'll be like, well, that's true. <laughs> and then yeah. they'll be like, uh, the white devil and he's like, <laughs> okay. And he's like, I mean, you know, <laughs> so it's really yeah. interesting and he uh, interviews a lot of the first episode is with like an American KKK. Group. Yeah, yeah, like a classic neo-Nazi American. And the guy and the guy has like a mixed race daughter. Yeah, and he so has so much cognitive dissonance that it's. I like, think she's part uh, Indian. Indian, yeah. yeah, and he's like, well, that's my daughter. Like, it's not the same. Yeah, you know, and so it's just definitely check out Hate Thy Neighbor. Yeah, it's really good. Um, um and and yeah, and also read about Marcus Garvey. He's a fascinating guy. I mean, yeah. he's considered a national hero in Jamaica. But he was also, you know, anti-Semitic. He was against mm -hmm. mixed race people. And I mean, it's, it's similar to the suffragette movement where it's like, yeah. you know, a lot of these movements that were liberatory in some ways, they still, you know, we can't have a president presentist view. We have to look at like, yeah. you know, like Margaret Sanger was a eugenicist. You know what exactly. I mean? Exactly. Yeah. And it's like why, why they had that point of view. Yeah. Um, and it's interesting since it's interesting learning about the UK having Black History Month because the UK has a weird, lots of racists in the UK. Yeah. Um, and because of their imperialist nature, there's so much racism against Indian people. Yeah, and uh, and Pakistani people. And Pakistani people. Yeah. Um, and so their relationship with black British people is different. Totally different. And I feel like I remember watching Doctor Who and other British yeah. shows when I was um, a kid and being like, there's so many black people in these shows. Yeah, yeah. Like... In American TV, I feel like uh, the 90s was a little bit more mixed. Yeah. But in the 2000s, a lot of American TV was very segregated. Oh, yeah. Um, so it was like maybe there'd be one black friend on a white TV show. Yeah. Um, but I was like, how come this... And when you turn on like UPN, it was all black faces, basically. Like, yeah. It was very, very segregated. You're right. I've never even really thought about that. But Let that's alone totally true. no shows with Latino people, no shows oh, with yeah. Asian mean, people. Forget it. Right. We're just now starting to get some in yeah. America. But yeah, like I was like, wow, in Doctor Who, like, it'll, like, 
they, it's just it was way more diverse than American TV had been to me. Yeah. Um, and that's when I first sort of learned about like, well, they have a different relationship, a different race relationship and different ideas of they have a different flavor different. of white supremacy exactly there. yeah yeah it's like we're still we're, we're still white supremacists yeah just... where they don't have the same grudge against black british people yeah and they they're... whereas the same way that in the u.s like you know people will make racist jokes about indians or whatever but it's not the same mm -hmm. level of absolute i mean absolute vitriol also polish people british people hate polish people i don't get it but it's a real thing. There's a lot of anti-Polish. Very weird. Because that was a big, the, one of the biggest influences on Brexit was like anti-Pakistani and anti-Polish. What the fuck? Um, yeah, we are an anti-Brexit podcast. Yeah, that's right. Sorry to say, no, not sorry, but like just putting that out there for our it's, Wikipedia. It seems like a bad idea. Brexit, yeah. <laughs> it I, seems like it was a so bad far, idea. So far, so bad. Yeah. Um, so, so back to Marcus Garvey, that was his. Oh, yeah, yeah. He so was like. His, the centenary of his birthday was one of the influences on uh, Britain, mm -hmm. the UK, choosing October as their Black oh. History Month, uh, instead of February. And then, in 1995, Canada proclaimed Black History Month as well. Um, it was a, a politician named Jean Augustine, who was the first Black mm -hmm. Canadian woman to be in Parliament It's in a French-Canadian. French. You know, maybe, but her name is Jean and she's a woman. It's not Jean. So, uh, I believe she's from Ontario. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it could be... I, at first I thought it was a man named Jean Augustine. And when mm -hmm. I looked it up, it's, it's a woman named Jean. So, And she is from Ontario. So, but Augustine, that's true. Uh, they uh, they picked February as well. Uh, same as ours. Okay. And they celebrate uh, black Canadians. Um, which is, you know, it's just it's nice of them. Uh, kind of like what we were just talking about the conversation with... Uh, about the different kinds of racism and white supremacy in the UK and the US... Canada also has a different uh, yeah. ethnic minority that they have their issues with, which They're are First Nations people. First yeah. Nations. Which obviously we do too, but, I mean, the tragedy is we killed so many of them in settling this country that we basically don't have to deal with Native mm -hmm. people anymore, which is very, very sad. Canada didn't kill as many. There's a lot, I mean, uh, th there is, I think, none of it in far northern Canada. It's basically an entire First Nations province that wow. was made recently, last like 20 years. But because they didn't have the same level of ethnic cleansing that uh, the founders of this country had, mm -hmm. it meant that they oppressed them in other ways. Yeah. But they're and, still dealing and with And it's like, I don't think we should, you know, blame or be so harsh on, you know, young people that are, you know, trying to learn or starting college when they m misunderstand, you know, that all of these relationships are so different. Yeah. Um, I mean, it just goes to show how much race is a construct, that it's like... Yeah. The, uh, the the pattern mm -hmm. persists, but who goes where changes. Yeah, I mean, and those little, and class and status still meant a lot in different places. Like, you could be the author of The Three Musketeers, Alexander Dumas, was a... Well, because France had a totally different yeah, thing, cause too. Yeah, because he was a uh, very well-off, highly respected, uh, half-black man in France. Yeah. And he had his own zoo. <laughs> That's the dream. That's the dream. And nowadays, of course, in France, it's just Muslims. They hate so much. Yeah. Now that's that's their a their new huge thing. all of continental Europe. And I, mean, I feel like the relationship too, but... in Europe with Muslim immigrants is very similar. I feel like to the anti uh, Mexican sentiment. Yeah. Where it's like they're coming in here, they're bringing their culture, Especially, they're not assimilating, and not just the anti Mexican sentiment. But if you look at the anti-Mexican sentiment as a a, a continuation mm -hmm. of the long-running anti-Catholic sentiment mm -hmm. in the U.S., I think it's an even better comparison there. Because it's not just that they're coming here, they're not assimilating, but it's, it's the also religious. there's this religious strife. Mm -hmm. Because we don't really think of it this way anymore because, you know, we've had now two Catholic presidents, mm -hmm. right? We have all kinds of Catholic. Rick Santorum is Catholic. You know what I mean? We don't think I of it anymore. he was evangelical. Nope. That, well, that's the thing. Is he may as well be, but no, he's Catholic. He's, he's Italian. Santoro. Uh, Don't even Santorum. Santorini. Yeah. Don't practice Santorini. Yeah, Santorum is is one Santorini. Um, oh no. <laughs> okay. But so fuck. Uh, for a long time, the opposition to Irish, Italian, Polish, mm -hmm. and to lesser extent Jewish, but it was very Catholic. Mm -hmm. Was an anti Catholic sentiment. The idea that they would be loyal to the Pope, not to America. The idea that Catholicism 
uh, was culturally incompatible with the United States because it taught you to be subservient to the mm-hmm. priest. You weren't a free thinker like the, pro- uh, the Protestants in the United mm-hmm. States. The I idea you is, started with a free thinker. A free thinker. I sound like a pirate. Um, Jeffrey Rush. But... <laughs> Um, and so, but there was a real belief that mm-hmm. Catholicism was not compatible with being American, mm-hmm. that it wasn't possible to which do Which is true. Which is 100% true. Um, and that's a big part of what this thing I'm in France... Kidding, no, of course you're kidding. I was just making sure. Um, uh, that was a Satan But, it, but it's over. because you're a, uh, a Catholic integralist who wants yes. to have a Catholic monarchy in the place of this uh, decadent and out of control democracy. Democracy. Um... <laughs> But so that's similar to the arguments they make in France now, is that Islam is just fundamentally, culturally incompatible with French values. They're like, we drink the wine, like, we uh, love it, the woman. Why you want to come here and tell us to uh, not to uh, not uh, love a woman? And Pepe Le Pew is that's like... That's talk. He's, yeah. It used to not even be legal to be Protestant in France. Okay. They're very strict about their <laughs> culture there. <laughs> no, but fuck France. <laughs> Weird name. No, okay. Um, so. So, uh, also at some point, the Netherlands established a black history at month. At some point. They're like, we're really yeah. white and we're really backwards on yeah. black they, people. They're like, can we keep Schwarze Pita if we have a black history they're month? They're like, listen, a compromise. Yeah. Can we keep a Schwarze Pita? It does. But so, we keep it the month. Now, I don't know what this is. <laughs> it's starting <laughs> Italian. What do we do with these? Hey, give me all these. Give me all these. What do we do with these? Italy, Jay. very racist. Oh, but in a, like a good-natured way. Like they're just like that's the take feel... you're going to get canceled for. <laughs> Italy, good-naturedly racist. <laughs> and then they came to uh, America. And they, they just brought, got regular racist. They just got regular racist, which is the Sopranos goes into uh, like uh, Italian. New York Italian racism yeah. in a really interesting way. Yeah, they do because it's that really very well. um, it's very specific. It's very tribal. Like mm-hmm. it's very like there. There's some people they aren't racist to, but it's like it's like that's your crew. This is my crew. Yeah, it's this it's, is your neighborhood. This is my. It's not so much like I think that you're a lesser kind of person mm-hmm. than me. It's just if you're not from around here, we don't we don't talk. Yeah. Like it's it's very much like hey, you might be great. I don't know you though. Mm-hmm. And I don't trust you. You're not I don't dating know you. my daughter. You're a different kind of guy. Yeah, like my uh, grandpa John, um, blessed be, he was a, a star football coach in Long Island, and um, he was. And so, as at these schools back when there were more programs for people, um, they he was also the driver's ed teacher. He also taught, I, I think, like history or something. Like they, you know, he just did a lot of things and was. Coach Fez, mm-hmm. and um, he taught at like a predominantly black school, and I think my aunt Felicia ended up going there. But like I remember, it was like, I mean, he was he was not racist toward them at all. He he you know had them over for dinner. He loved his uh, his football team. Yeah. But um, I remember it was like it was like oh, but that's not your commu- yeah. like it was still your grandpa was like was like Viggo Mortensen in Green Book. Where he's just like, what's up with all this racism? Hey, just come on over and have a I pie. I haven't seen Green Book. I can assume that. But, like, yeah, there, there was, what's like... What's up with the racismo? It was, all, it was like some people wouldn't go do that, you know? Um, oh, yeah. Because there's these, like, the different schools, you know? Yeah. Even though there was some integration, it was still... Yeah. Um, so New York has a very interesting... It's fascinating. It uh, really is. Racial history. It's, like, anthropologically fascinating. Yeah. Because it's a lot of the, like... Yeah, it's a lot of very that. tribal. Like, the, it's this very is tribal. my group. Yeah. And also this idea of, like, who's assimilating, who's not assimilating. Who's... Is it, do you want to assimilate? Do you mm-hmm. not? And, yeah, it is, like, it is very much not based in ideas of supremacy. It's based in ideas of tribe, of tribes. Yeah, and that, it, that's, it's interesting. I think with... that's a key difference between a lot of other kinds of racism. Yeah, and with, like, that season of Fargo we talked about in our Prohibition episode about gangs, um... You know, like the Irish gang and the black gang and all yeah, this stuff. The Jewish gang. The, um, is, yeah, a lot of these gangs were racial. And on The Sopranos, it's very like with true crime, or with crime, it's very like, um, you know, like we're an Italian gang and you're a black gang and maybe we'll do some deals. Yeah. But like, we're not going to ever be the same gang. Yeah, it's like we can get along, we can be friends, so but we're never going to yeah. be family. So it's like Italians. Italian Americans that aren't criminals, which there are some of them. Um, I, I've they, heard that. You know, but I don't they, know. Yeah, 
you know, it's like that, you know, that's not, they were, the less criminalized the Italians became, hopefully the less racist. Legalized Italians. Legal, okay. Um, and finally, the last country that has a Black History Month, and then we'll go into the other subject of our episode, is Ireland. They established one in 2010, um, in part to pat themselves on the back a little bit, because Ireland, especially the city of Cork, was a major, major center. A whole city made of cork? Yeah, yeah, a whole city made of cork. Sounds soft. They were a major center of abolitionism in the 19th century. And, like, Frederick Douglass and a lot of other leading black abolitionists Mm -hmm. would do speaking tours of Ireland. And because they were allowed to, basically. That's cool. Um, And uh, so there was a lot of, you know, mutual positivity there. A, A lot of Irish people came and fought for the Union, during the Civil War. Um, a lot of Irish oh. people fought for Mexico during the Mexican-American War to prevent the spread of slavery um, into Texas. It, it, didn't we just... We just started Warrior yeah. uh, on HBO, I think? It's now on HBO Max. Um, and, yeah. like, the first episode, there's all these Irish cops, and they are, you know, hating on the Chinese. The show is about... Chinese immigrants in San Francisco in like 19th century San Francisco yeah and yeah. so there, and then there's uh, martial arts it's very cool um it, it's it, what's cool is that it's it's predominantly about these Chinese characters yeah so you know they're kind of getting thwarted by these Irish cops and they basically say like we fought for you in the civil war or not like or like we fought with you yeah or something like they're or they're just very like there's a lot of there's a lot of resentment over yeah the there's a lot of like and... we we were anti-racist, and now, like, that hasn't helped our status in any way. <laughs> yeah, what did we um, get out of that? like, hey, hey, hold your jaw. That was oh, my uh, hold your Irish. Hold your hold your we fought for you, now you're mad. And um, anyway, So that's... Leave it to us for our Black History Month. We just still go into our Italian and Irish <laughs> yeah. voices the well, whole we, time. Well, we can roast them comfortably. Yeah. <laughs> comfortably roasted. Um... But so that's that's the history of Black History Month. So cool. That's basically the deal. And, you know, there are other blank history months um, that you can look into. It's, we- it's weird, though, because sometimes they feel, you know, arbitrary or they feel like, wait, which is, wh-? you know, like Pride Month is June, I think. And, Pride Month is June, yeah. Yeah, and there's, I think now March is like Women's History Month, and it's frustrating because... Um, A big problem in women's history, a big problem in women's studies, um, in gender studies, in uh, education spheres, is that it's, it means white women's month, you know, like, it's like, Black History Month has to encompass black women and black men um, and black non-binary people. And then it's like, women's history month, that's for all the white women, you know, like, it's like, yeah. Hey, you know, so it, it's just a weird... Interestingly about... And why isn't there men's history? I'm just kidding. Yeah, it, it, so many times it'd be like, so all the women and the black women... I was like, wait a minute, aren't black <laughs> women women... You know, so it's... Poor kids are just as smart, just as talented as white kids. Yeah. The president. Joe said, Biden, our president, our said... Our wonderful Poor president. kids are just as... As talented, as, talented as, as white kids. As white kids. That... He rocks. said that within the last year. And then he became year. the president. <laughs> then he won the presidency. At least he's not Trump. Trump watch. Is he doing a speech today at tonight, CPAC? Tonight at CPAC. The return of the he's king. He's ending he's Black back. History Month. He's back. Okay. He's back, baby. Um, <laughs> so I just want to say real quick about the other uh, two other months. Uh-huh. Interestingly, Pride Month and LGBT History Month are different months. Mm. Pride Month is in June. Mm-hmm. Because of Stonewall. Stonewall. Mm-hmm. Uh, LGBT History Month is in October. Seems maybe as arbitrarily chosen. Because Halloween is fun. That might be and it. And everyone dresses up. That might be it. Um, <laughs> Women's History Month is indeed in March. Mm-hmm. And it, it Which was... always just feels like, all right, Black History Month is done. Time to post pictures of Susan B. Anthony and Taylor Swift. And it's like, stop! Yeah, it was picked because of National Women's Day. Is in March. Yeah, it's just... Which the first National Women's Day was actually February 28th, 1909. Oh my god. Uh, it was National Women's Day organized by the Socialist Party of America at the suggestion of activist Teresa Malkiel. Hell yeah. So, that's pretty sick. Um, and of course, you know, in the early women's movement, the early suffragist movement, it's like, there were abolitionists, there were women of color leading these movements... Um, and so, of course, they got completely erased. Yeah. 
So, cool. We love to see it. <laughs> we don't love to see it. I think we love to see it. Hey, you know what else is coming up? What? Irish American Heritage Month. March? Wait, no. Wait. Yeah. We're taking it from you. <gasps> That's okay. Um, because it's St. Patrick's Day. Hoi to toy to toy. Getting all the snakes out of Ireland. Hoi to toy. A great anti pagan day. Very cool. The but there's also no snakes in Ireland. For there real. never were. Wait. Okay. Then how did Jamie get bit by a snake in Outlander in Scotland? Oh, no, that Scotland was in America. Scotland and Ireland are different places no, that was in North anyway. Carolina. We've been watching Outlander. Okay. Um, um, so let's get uh, to this subject of, you know, when I thought of stories that are not often told um in regards to black history month um i thought of fanny lou hamer unless you think it's pronounced hammer i think it's hamer fanny lou hamer i just fucking learned about her um she was a plus size woman uh born uh 1917 1917 in the mississippi delta in the mississippi delta sounds like i'm feeding you lines for yeah. but i just had the information yeah. right here and um and, you know, her life, it is checkered with a lot of, you know, the aspects of, you know, stories you usually would hear in Black History Month. There's voter suppression. There's, um, you know, getting beat. There's, uh, you know, segregated locations. There's forced hysterectomy. Like, all of these things. And that's, be and it's not, you know, necessarily a universal experience, but it's a very black american experience in this entire yeah past century that is so there's, fucking shameful there's an argument to be made that it's that fanny lou hamer's life and her the things that she accomplished mm -hmm. are a, a key black american experience narrative yeah and it's it like, hits so many important points that and it's and yet it's been forgotten she's been forgotten the fact that like the women of these that we do popularly talk about you know, like Harriet Tubman, who was just the ultimate, like, just fucking in incredible, uh, powerful goddess of liberation. Yeah. And endured so much abuse and uh, saved so many people successfully. Um, like, uh, Black Moses, a female Moses, you yeah. know, was what she was referred to, I believe. Um, but then it's like, in the next century, we're like, oh, Rosa Parks, she sat on a bus. And, you know, and it's like, yeah. Rosa Parks was so much more radical, just like MLK. Yeah, she we, was, we don't tend to we've teach that as a... we completely whitewashed our black history. Yeah, and her sitting in that bus was not a uh, spontaneous act. Yeah, that the, was it planned... literally is like, I remember seeing it depicted as like, she's just like, you know, the front of the bus seems nice today. Like, yeah, there's it's an... like a Plessy v. Ferguson. Have you ever heard the history of Plessy v. Ferguson? I have. Um, just a quick recap for the listeners. So it was this landmark Supreme Court case in the late 19th century that was similar to the Rosa Parks situation because mm -hmm. it was a manufactured, activist-driven controversy to attempt to get a particular ruling. So basically, uh, this a, a, uh, a group of activists wanted to... Uh, get on the books. To, to strike down uh, segregation so yeah. everybody equal. Um, they intentionally violated what was called the Louisiana Separate Car Act of 1890, which required equal but separate train car accommodations for white and non-white passengers. So Homer Plessy, who was one-eighth black, um, he uh, he went on a, a, a whites-only train car, mm -hmm. but told them all, like, guys, I'm black. I'm an eighth black. Mm -hmm. So he got charged for it. Uh, his lawyers defended him saying it was unconstitutional. They lost... Went to the uh, Louisiana Supreme Court, appealed all to the U.S. Supreme Court, which in a seven to one decision oh, said that separate but equal did not violate the 14th Amendment. That was the case. Mm -hmm. The 14th Amendment is the equal protection, includes the equal protection clause, which says that all people are equal under the law. They have equal protection under the law. So the idea of Homer Plessy's lawyers were trying to put forward what they thought was a slam dunk mm -hmm. case demonstrating that the provision of separate but equal facilities was not equal protection under the law. But Chief Justice Melville Fuller said... Uh, Melville Fuller shit. That's right, Melville Fuller shit. <laughs> um, the only dissent was from John Harlan, who interestingly... John Harlan Globetrotter. That's right. Um, 
he was born into a slaveholding family in Kentucky. Mm-hmm. John Harlan was. Uh, but he signed up for the 10th Kentucky Infantry during the Civil War on the side of the Union. Mm. We may have talked about that Kentucky and Missouri were both border states between the Union and the Confederacy, and they basically put forward armies for both. Yeah. They had a lot of people that were on both sides. Um, they never abolished slavery until it was abolished mm-hmm. nationwide, but they also never seceded. So that's why that's the complication of it. But so Harlan what's called the Great Dissenter because he was a, a very strict civil libertarian and whenever there was mm. a case that was restricting civil liberties, he would always write blistering dissents. Libertarians, actually, um, it's more recent libertarians that are pretty racist, but the Libertarian Party has an actually pretty... Yeah, they um, were... The Libertarian Party actually just in 2020 was like very involved in the George Floyd protests and stuff like that. Yeah, it used, it used to be way more like... Feminism being a part of yeah. the movement, anti-racism being part of libertarian. It anyway, let's only, just look it up. If it was only interested. in the '90s, basically, that right wingers took over libertarianism. Yeah. Anyway, um, um, so oh, we're talking about, we're talking about how uh, how uh, Rosa Parks and, and similar people were sanitized. I mean, Homer, and, Homer Plessy was sanitized. We don't talk about him as an actor. And I was gonna say what I was what I was saying about the difference between how we depict. Harriet Tubman is um, and Rosa Parks is that like we wouldn't we don't have these female civil rights leaders from the 20th century that are depicted as getting brutalized yeah. it's like it's like well this was you know she just was sitting and then she got arrested but like she wasn't manhandled she wasn't abused but with Harriet Tubman, it's like, okay, well, we're talking about slavery, which is so brutal, so we can discuss how they beat her head in until she had seizures, like, yeah. and was blind. Um, and it's like when the truth is, the breeding, the beatings were just as brutal uh, post slavery, and we just uh, to women and we ignore it. We'll yeah. we'll talk about how, um, you know, how some black men were physically abused. Like we talk in, uh, you know the 60s we we talk about it but yeah. it's like we don't show women getting attacked by cops getting dogs sicked on them getting um you know uh pelted with fire hoses uh just, like it's like yeah we don't when it's like fanny lou hamer um she experienced a lot of that brutality and yeah they would not show a woman in a nice modern sundress a black woman in a nice modern sundress getting the shit beaten out of her in recent history. Yeah. We don't show that to kids. We yeah. can say, then Harriet Tubman was beaten because she was a slave. And it's like, okay, we get it. Yeah. But um, well, we don't talk about the recent history of abuse toward black women. Yeah. So let's talk about it. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, podcast's over. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. um, no, but before we get to Family Hammer, the last thing I want to say about, I just want to give credit to the organization that recruited Homer Plessy. Which was the comedy to say? What, ugh, let me try it again. The organization that I want to, before we move on to Fannie Lou Hamer, I want to give credit to the organization that recruited Homer Plessy, the Comité de Citoyen, which is the Citizens Committee, mm-hmm. which is a group in Louisiana made up of uh, Black Americans, White Americans, and Creoles. That was a a citizens uh, anti uh, racism group. That's so, cool. Comité de Citoyens. So. We'll talk about Fannie Lou Hamer. Um, and some of our sources for our discussion about Fannie Lou Hamer are the Washington Post and Food and Wine magazine. Actually. That's right. Um, so Fannie Lou Hamer, like you were saying, she was born in 1917 uh, to a very poor sharecropper family in the Mississippi Delta. Which is like what happened after slavery was like basically people still, black people still living in uh, very poor and lives of essentially servitude as yeah. sharecroppers, but they're like, well, they're free. Yeah, sharecropping was also something that, that existed during slavery as well. There were a lot of white sharecroppers too. Yeah. Basically, there were people that worked land they didn't own. Yeah. Uh, my ancestors were also sharecroppers mm-hmm. in, in Mississippi, but they were white and probably virulently racist. Um, But so her story really begins in 1962. When she's, what, 45 years old. Wow. Right? And she basically finds out at a, at a meeting of, of SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, mm. um, she finds out that she's eligible to vote. Mm. 
mm-hmm. that black Americans in Mississippi are eligible to vote. And she said in an interview, like, didn't know. Didn't know that. That she was allowed to, even. So she volunteers in a similar way to Rosa Parks, in a similar way to Homer Plessy. She volunteers to put herself on the line, go into the courthouse, and register to vote. Um, and uh, what she said was, I guess if I had any sense, I'd have been a little scared. But she said, but what was the point of being scared? The only thing the whites could do was kill me. And it seemed like they've been trying to do that a little bit at a time since I could remember. Yeah. I mean, I think was her uh, forced hysterectomy earlier. This was earlier. Um, when she went to uh, the hospital for uh, the removal of a uterine tumor, um, they... Uh, Gave her a Mississippi appendectomy. Exactly, which was aka the forced sterilization. Yeah, of black women, hysterectomy. Which yeah. uh, the lovely, the lovely um, uh, detention centers that both Trump and Joe Biden seem to be indulging in yeah. have also been doing forced sterilization of brown women. Yeah. So not much has changed. Cool. No, more things change. More things. Vote blue, no matter who. Um. So she, as she put it, she went down to register to become a first class citizen. At the courthouse. <laughs> awesome. Um, they were required to take a literacy test, which, of course, was specifically created to prevent black people from voting because many of them couldn't read. I want to take a quick moment mm-hmm. to talk about literacy. When we talk about illiteracy and literacy, we tend to think about it as, Can you do you read? recognize what words are or do you see scribbles on a page? Yeah. It's a lot more complicated than that. Most, most people, even people that we would consider illiterate, mm-hmm. if they exist in society, can read basic words. They can read a stop sign, right? They can read a sign that says open. It's almost like smarts. Street smarts. Yeah. Book Literacy smarts, is the like, ability you... to know what, what you're reading means. Mm-hmm. They can speak English. They can read letters, right? They didn't... Illiteracy isn't like dyslexia, where you actually can't read what it is. But a literacy test was to see if you knew what you were talking about. It was to see if you understood the law. And they used it... Governments have used it... Um, because of its loose definition, so that they yeah. could basically t- mean literacy could be whatever they wanted. It exactly. To mean. Exactly. They, but the, exactly. And nowadays, I think that we use the term literacy tests because it sounds like you have to know how to read to vote. Mm-hmm. And I think that a lot of people, you know, understand like, well, that's no good. But there are still people that like the idea of having a test to be able to yeah. vote. That's the same thing. Yeah. It's a literacy test. That's what you're putting forward. Um, so they had to take a literacy test to demonstrate that they could read basically beyond a first grade level. Um, now, I do also want to say, there obviously were people that couldn't read at all, but that was uncommon. Yeah. Uncommon then as it is now. Um, they also had to say who they worked for and where they lived, which was information that the KKK used to find and intimidate black people to turn to register to vote, according to the Washington Post. And remember, at this time, a lot of people that would have worked in this courthouse were in the KKK. Yeah. The governor was probably in the KKK. I think that Ted Bilbo was a senator at this time who was a KKK leader for decades. And he had the rings. So and he, he had, coming and he, all crazy, and he, and he could go Ted invisible. Bilbo. Um, it's, it's difficult to overstate how entrenched the Ku Klux Klan was. Yeah. In the United States. Um, and, and I feel like people literally don't believe and understand how many politicians to this day, like Trump, yeah. uh, have Klansmen as their parents, grandparents, have Nazis as their parents, grandparents. is all so recent. We, I think that we talked before on this podcast about how on the day 9-11 happened, if Bush and Cheney had both died, uh, then the president would have been convicted child molester Dennis Hastert, right? If Dennis Hastert died, or if for whatever reason went past him, the next person in line was a Klansman, was an actual Klansman in the 1940s, Senator Robert Byrd, who was a so senator for a temporary. 2001, we could have had a child molester and then a Nazi, or a Klansman. A, a Klansman. And Robert Byrd was a Democrat. He was the head of the Democrats yeah. in the Senate. Ow. And basically. Vote blue no matter who's a KKK member? Yeah. Basically, with. I believe only a two-year exception from 79 to 81. From pretty much the Kennedy administration up until 2006, 2007 or so, every single Senate pro tem leader, which is the third in line for the presidency after the speaker, was either 
an actual Klansman or an outspoken and aggressive segregationist. That's how uh, mainstream that was. I mean, we're talking through the 90s, to the 80s. You had Strom Thurmond, you had uh, Stennis, you had uh, prefer, Eastland. I'd prefer an actual cannibal, a.k.a. <laughs> Army Hammer. Hammer um, Watch. Hammer Watch. I don't know. He's, yeah, he's, don't... Gone, he's gone to ground. We don't know what's up yeah. with him. Um, there's a great quote in WAPO about uh, the clerk asked Hammer to interpret a section of uh, de facto laws in the Constitution. The state Constitution. In the state Constitution. She said, I know as much about a facto law as a horse knows about Christmas Day. Yeah. Um, and so they failed the literacy test. She, she like, and the other person went. I'll be fucking back. <laughs> yeah. She didn't actually invented I'll be back. Yeah. Uh, Ernest Davis was who went with her. That's mm-hmm. the other person that went to go register. Uh, when she got back to the plantation that she worked on, because mm-hmm. Sheriff Roberts worked on plantations, uh, she was fired that same day, basically for pretending to do this. So she joined SNCC, which was a, a major early civil rights group mm-hmm. that uh, I believe MLK was involved with, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And she helped to found the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. Now, this party kind of gets to the fact that a lot of people in the U.S. have a much narrower view of what a political party is Mm -hmm. than most of the world. We tend to view parties as discrete organizations with a ballot line that runs candidates. Mm -hmm. It's not really that simple. Um, There oftentimes are parties that organize within other parties. I mean, that's kind of what the DSA does, the Democratic mm-hmm. Socialists of America, do with the Democratic Party. The DSA is effectively a political party. It just uses... They don't the... run candidates, but they... Uh, well, they do run candidates. No. They don't run candidates of their own. They yeah, use that's what the... I mean. Yeah, they, exactly. They endorse, but yeah. they don't. Well, they, they, they use the infrastructure and... Um, they use the infrastructure and ballot line of the Democratic Party. Mm-hmm. To organize their own interests. Which some people disagree with that, but, you know, it's, sometimes it's been working. As long as our ballot systems are designed by the state governments... Mm-hmm. To be two-party. That's the only and... way to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's, so I'm, I'm not so... even a registered Dem, and that's my official stance at this point. So Hamer's like, fuck this, and starts organizing. Yeah, so she joins... Or she, she helps start the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, which is sort of a response to the state's rights Democratic Party, which was founded in the late 40s by Strom Thurmond, uh, because in 1948, at that uh, Democratic mm-hmm. National Convention, was the first time there was a desegregated National Convention for a party. This isn't in this article. This so I just he know was like... Hand. So Harry Truman allowed black delegates to come mm-hmm. be part of it. Um, and so Strom Thurmond let a walk out. At this time, Strom Thurmond was a Democrat. He later became a Republican. Strom Thurmond, friend of Joe Biden, yeah. our president. Um, Strom Thurmond did a, did a walk out. And started the state's rights Democratic Party, also known as the Dixiecrats, the through which he ran. Dicks. He ran third party in 1948, and I believe won a couple states. No. Um, so, Hamer helps found the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, which is a an anti segregationist, anti racist, social democratic party. That's so cool. She runs for Congress in 1964 against the Democratic incumbent Jamie L. Witten, a white person, a white man. Um, <laughs> Jamie L. White Man. Jamie L. White Man. And she uh, loses, obviously. But she ran and she got a lot of attention for it. So cool. Which... Never heard of her. It's yeah. Like... Which is what allows her to help lead a delegation to the 1964 Democratic National Convention. So, the Democratic National Convention in 1964, which, just remember for, um, for con- context's sake... Mm-hmm. This is right after Kennedy was killed, right? So things were things were crazy, crazy. at this point. The tensions were really high. Stuff was was rough. Mississippi sends their state delegation to the uh, the DNC, mm-hmm. and they're all white men, mostly conservative, Southern Democrat, segregationist white men. So Fannie Lou Hamer and the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, the MFDP. They decided to send their own slate of, of delegates. DP. That's right. Their own slate of delegates to the DNC, including her, that are black and leftist. They go, and Lyndon Johnson says, N- No, we're not going to seat you. <laughs> He's like, like, Wait, what? So Johnson um, told advisors that he was, you know, couldn't take the pressure. Of, you know, needing the support of Southern Democrats to win. He's like, fuck, like, we gotta handle this Mississippi situation. And he said, last night I couldn't sleep. 
About 2.30, I waked up. I do not believe I can physically and mentally carry the responsibilities of the world and the N-words and the sound. Um, so anyway, yeah, he yeah. Was, she really got under his skin. Great. <laughs> so he, he basically, he's pissed, right? Because he's yeah. like, this is, what his concern is, is that it's going to burn all the Southern Democrats again. This is his stated concern. He also was probably personally racist, but he would go on to sign the 1964 uh, Civil Rights Act. Mm -hmm. So he's not opposed to working with people of color and stuff. So he doesn't want a a repeat of 1948, basically. Mm -hmm. He doesn't want to burn the Southern Democrats. Of course, he's about to go on to win one of the largest landslides in U.S. history, so he doesn't have that much to worry about. But he basically says, like, this has to end. We have to stop this problem. And he tells Hubert Humphrey to fix it. (laughs) Hubert Humphrey is a guy that I think maybe has gotten a little bit of an unfair shake Hubert from history. Hubert Humphrey Holmes, H.H. H. Holmes. Yeah, that's right. No, sorry. <laughs> he was a senator from, I believe, Minnesota. Mm-hmm. And he was way more progressive than uh, Johnson mm-hmm. was. He, was. he was very progressive, actually. But, like, in a quiet Midwestern way. Mm-hmm. So Johnson tells Humphrey to fix it because Humphrey wants to become the vice president. Mm-hmm. And Johnson says, if you can fix this, then you're on a ticket basically, if you can fix the Mississippi problem. And so Humphrey sits down with Fannie Lou Hamer. And uh, he, he says that what Johnson has said is that he will not allow illiterate women to speak on the floor of the Democratic Convention. Because Fannie Lou Hamer wants to give a speech, mm-hmm. wants to give a primetime speech. And uh, Hamer says, well, Mr. Humphrey, do you mean to tell me that your position is more important to you than 400,000 black people's lives? Right? And so... Because at this point, Humphrey's like, if I can seal this deal, then I'll Mm. give him the vice president. A lot of this reminds me of how the DNC in 2016 treated Nina Turner, who was a state senator. The donuts. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Look up. Donut Twitter still has donuts in their psychopaths. Yeah, like they literally, like Nina Turner was like, I have a petition. I have word from of what people's needs are. And And they they... tried to buy her off of the pack of of donuts and a bunch of uh, yeah. psychos on Twitter think it's hilarious. Um, and now Nina Turner's running for Congress. Congress, so please. And she's probably going to win. Look up speeches from Nina Turner. Nina Turner is And of the... course, look up the speeches from Fannie Lou Hamer. Yeah, Nina Turner is the front runner in that race, and that is a heavily Democratic district. So she's probably going to win and win the seat. I believe it's in Cleveland. I mean, it's like Cleveland to think of area. them trying to, in the uh, 60s, in the 70s? When? Trying to keep... Trying to keep Fannie Lou Hamer... The 60s. The 60s, trying to keep her out of uh, the DNC. Yeah. And you literally have the same thing. Or, like, obviously the DNC is much more, uh, much less, much more progressive now. The DNC is in a better position it's now. It's in a better it position now. I'm not saying it was. But yeah. it's like to think of how much they were silencing and abusing Nina Turner um, under the guise of, like, we know what's best. We know, like, Stay, it just yeah. makes me mad. So, Hamer uh, is offered a compromise from mm-hmm. Humphrey, which is the the Democratic Party will allow the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party to send two at-large delegates. Mm-hmm. They're basically just two delegates can come that are representing them. Mm-hmm. As long as one of them is not Hamer. <laughs> uh, the Freedom Party Two voted, of them, right? <laughs> yeah. The Freedom Party voted unanimously to reject this compromise. Oh. Cool. And uh, so she does end up giving a speech mm-hmm. to to the convention. And remember, at this point, they did watch the conventions. They watched the speeches on TV. But it was, it was also still an actual function where the party has to get together and vote on what they're doing as a party. So there were a lot of speeches that weren't necessarily televised, right? But she wanted hers to be. So she was able to go give her testimony, give her speech. And she finds out that Lyndon Johnson held a news conference at the mm-hmm. same time as her speech, prevented from being televised. But that night, the evening news replayed her speech on primetime. Hell yeah. So she did get her, her speech out there. Um, um, I believe, because you know, we're looking at the same source, um, she, uh, uh, you know, she brought in her purse, put it on the table, Spoke for 13 minutes without notes. Yeah, just, incredible. Um, telling, Talking about, uh, you know, black people getting beaten nearly to death because they wanted to vote. Um, and uh, she had followed the wife of Michael Schwerner, um, civil rights, one of three civil rights workers who was killed uh, two months earlier near Philadelphia, Mississippi. 
in uh, during the Mississippi burning yeah. uh, situation. Um, so it's like she was following that. Um, she was, you know, there's there's footage if you look up Fannie Lou Hamer's powerful testimony on YouTube, you can see her in like a sundress, looking, you know, pretty exasperated, holding her big purse. I just think it's so cool. It reminds me of like people that like women bringing their purses on stage for stuff because it's yeah. like that's so emblematic i feel of like like women having to uh you know especially black women having to like hold their own protect their own yeah it's also you can't trust anybody it's also all business it's all business yeah. and it just goes to show how often we don't have women on stage doing these things because yeah. it's like where do you put your purse every time i've done a show uh it's been like do I hand it to someone? Do I put it in front of the microphone? Do I, uh, you know, when I've, you know, with my all women improv team, like my friend Avery would always leave her purse on stage um, and people would kind of tease her about it. And um, there's just something incredibly powerful about that. Um, I wanted to share a quote from her, one of her famous campaign speeches from when she was running for Congress, even though she lost. Um, she said, my opponent has done nothing to help the Negro in the second congressional district. If I'm elected as Congresswoman, things will be different. We are sick and tired of being sick and tired. For so many years, the Negroes have suffered in the state of Mississippi. We are tired of people saying that we are satisfied because we are anything but satisfied. Um, and the, uh, we are sick and tired of being sick and tired is on her gravestone. Yeah. Pretty um, powerful. That's a, that's a phrase that has been co-opted so much and yeah. I you know never attributed to her yeah so you know she got her speech on TV they obviously did not seat the mm -hmm. Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party um so we're gonna jump ahead to 1967 okay when she helps found the Freedom Farm Cooperative mm -hmm. the FFC oh so cool so basically this is because oh she also helped to found the National Women's Political Caucus by the way which I just saw um, pretty incredible. So basically, it was at this point in time, farming was still a big part of how people survived, mm -hmm. especially in rural areas. Um, and a lot of black Americans were cut out from getting what they needed from the white power structures of these states and from the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Uh, the USDA would routinely reject African American farmers' loans for land, uh, impose other policies that caused black farmers to lose their land. And they had to come sharecroppers, basically. It's which very, it like, um, and I think we see this uh, with Mexican immigrants here, yeah. where it's like, okay, you're free, but we're going to make it very difficult for you to have any independence. Yeah. You're still going to be rely, you're still going to rely on the welfare system. You're still going to rely on your bosses. You're still going to, you don't have any freedom. Yeah. Which is, which is the sharecropping system, yeah. basically. Um, from the century between the end of the Civil War in 1965... I'm sorry, 1865 to 1964, mm. uh, black farmers lost approximately 12 million acres of farmland in the Mississippi Delta area alone. And 6 million of those acres were lost between 1950 and 1964. Jeez. This is really important because we tend to take for granted that history is progressive. Mm -hmm. And it is not. Yeah. Sometimes things get a lot worse before they get better. Yeah, I mean, I think with the total erasure of transgender people of queer Absolutely. romances and relationships it's like there were a lot of out people and relationships maybe they were labeled as different things at the time um but you know like the nazis erased yeah. by destroying so much literature about same being happened, queer same happened at the end of reconstruction yeah um i don't think that it's controversial even to say that if you're a black person in Mississippi, mm -hmm. you're better off in 1871 than you would have been in 1911. So shocking. You know, um, because once Reconstruction ended, they basically just gave the South back to the former Confederacy. And boy, did they come back with a vengeance. Um, wow. Yeah, there's a... Uh, two... Doesn't mean things can't get better. As, uh, no, to paraphrase Martin Luther King, the arc of justice... The, the moral arc... arc of the universe is long that it bends towards justice. Yeah, but that doesn't mean it doesn't go back and forth. You can't and... take for granted that it's going to get better. Yeah. History is not on a track. It's not automatic. Yeah. Um, two great works on Reconstruction, by the way, that I just want to recommend. Eric Foner's Reconstruction. And uh, W.B. Du Bois wrote a great book called Black Reconstruction in America. 
They're both classic text on it. Um, but so in order to combat this issue with, with uh, access to farming, the, or the access to the necessities of farming, Fannie Lou Hamer set up the uh, Freedom Farm Cooperative, which was basically a way to get the stuff you need for farming to black farmers to help them survive. Uh, the three main goals, you know, addressing and enriching the nutritional needs of black Americans, creating access to affordable housing, and fostering entrepreneurship opportunities in order to set up their own farms. Which is so cool and still so relevant and part of a uh, long history of penny scratching. We can leave that on the show. Come on, Penny. I mean... It's quite loud. She's so cute. She's almost done. It's good for her. Okay, go into your little bed. Let's ignore her. Um, uh, food security, food independence. Uh, you know, um, black activists, especially women mothers uh they've been leading the charge on this in communities um for so long and especially including now um you know running food banks running community uh, running programs that get kids food in school you know because these are issues that are completely ignored by our penny completely ignored by our white supremacist government Mm -hmm. so it's one of those things where it's like Black women have had to take those matters into their own hands. Um, yeah. So, that's exactly right. Um, the way the FFC worked, basically, was it was a farm. It was a farm co-op that people could come and work for a few hours on the farm mm-hmm. and be paid with a bushel of produce. Um, they, uh, there's like snap peas, butter beans, squash, peas, cucumbers, things like that. Now, this was both good because it's food... But it's also good because they could take these this produce home and plant it, and grow it, mm. grow their own farms. It allowed over 1,500 families to sustain themselves by growing cash crops and vegetables. Which reminds me of, I took on some class about uh, like agriculture or something, and it talked about like how Obama, a lot of his like f- food programs that he would, you know, that we would do in terms of giving aid to other countries... It was all, you know, sponsored by, like, Nestle, Nabisco, yeah. whatever. And so, like, a lot of the food aid that America gives to low-income Americans and other countries is shit that they can't sustain themselves on. That's the thing. And, is... and a lot of that is because companies like Monsanto have copywritten seeds and shit. Yeah, they it's so selfish. genetically engineer the seeds it's and like, then copyright it. It's like, okay, we'll give you food aid, but it's going to basically be food you can eat once and it's gone. It's going to be, or it's un- going to be, it's going to be unhealthy you, food. There's going to be seeds that you can grow, but you can't you sell for profit. Them, you don't you own can't it. Sell for pro- You're a sharecropper, basically. You're basically completely dependent on yeah. us. Um, um, so uh, they also constructed over 200 homes, many of which are still standing in Louisville, Mississippi. Wow. Um, provided some financial assistance to thousands of rural people to purchase homes with running water and heat, which was previously inaccessible to a lot of people in the area. Um... And uh, families were charged a dollar a month to use the the help that they needed to get these homes and things like that. Um, a lot of this sounds like proto, like Black Lives Matter, you know, a, a lot of what yeah. those groups have been doing. The FFC also ran a Head Start program for kids, mm. uh, preschool, free preschool. Uh, Which Johnson was a Head Start teacher. Uh, Johnson created the Head Start program. He created the Head Start program. So yeah. that's one of the... Good things, Johnson. It's part of the Great Society. Uh, Johnson was a teacher. He was a first grade teacher. It was his first ever job um, along the, Mex- the Mexican-Texas border. Imagine a man that talked about his bunghole so much being a first grade teacher. And by all accounts, he loved it. He loved those kids. Um, <laughs> he loved talking about his bunghole. He loved telling them all about his bunghole. No. Um, but so uh, they had a Head Start program, commercial kitchen, community gardens, and a garment factory. Um, and... Uh, a lot of the people that had came to work there in this co-op were fired for voting, just like Fannie Lou Hamer was. We didn't fired we for actually trying to vote. didn't mention that during her famous speech at the DNC, she talks about what happened to her in 1963 when she uh, like was going back to you know and bringing some friends, I believe, to vote, mm-hmm. and they got brutally arrested 
brutally assaulted by the cops in perverted ways, um, just beat into hell, uh, imprisoned. Um, is it was really brutal, and she talked about that in her speech, which was aired on TV. So that was just really cool. Yeah. So part of the problem that they were dealing with is the fact that the Mississippi Delta had been in large part emptied out by anybody with means because of jobs with the New Deal elsewhere and just better opportunity Mm -hmm. in the North, the Midwest, and the West. And so Hamer was really committed to revitalizing her community, to making sure that they all access what they need. And uh, a year after they made the FFC, she was able to buy another 640 acres and started a pig bank. Which is, they bought five male pigs, it's Jersey like a piggy boars. bank, but with literal pigs. Yeah, they bought five male pigs and 50 female pigs. Hell yeah, those and five male pigs are going to They were fuck. having a good time. Um, <laughs> Hammer believed that as long as people had a pig, they <laughs> would never... five male pigs. Okay. But so... Um, yeah. Take fam- a pig, leave a pig. No, just just take a pig. Okay. Um, Hamer believed that as long as people had a pig, they wouldn't starve to death. Hamer Toyota, but it's pig. Okay, sorry. <laughs> oh my God, I'm just trying to get through this. We're, we're read like an hour 20 on this. Good. I'm so tired. Um, so, basically, having, having a, a pig, having pigs that you could breed yourself, mm-hmm. it allowed families to go upwards of a year without purchasing ham or lard from the commissary at the plantation, mm-hmm. which is huge. Yeah. Huge, huge, huge. They were able to salt the pork and keep it, you know, for a long time, refrigerate it when they had electricity. Um, it was a big deal. It was a really big deal. And, and Harry Belafonte came and supported it. Hell it was, yeah. It was awesome. The problem was that they just weren't, it wasn't run super well. And it wasn't run super financially stably. So, so it sounds like she, you know, spreading herself thin. Like, exactly. Well, and, and which is what happens with a lot of people that try to run sort of ambitious, ambitious utopian. social justice, utopian ideas in a capitalist framework. Mm-hmm. We're out of money. Um, in 1976, Hamer was sick with breast cancer and didn't have a lot of money. So the FFC closed down. And a year later, she passed away at the age of 59. Um, so... There's a lot of really powerful, positive things to take from this, but it is ultimately... Well, you know what? I say it's ultimately a sad story, but that's not even the case. Thousands of families survive that may not have Mm -hmm. because of this. Just because it couldn't sustain itself in the long run doesn't mean that the people it sustained didn't get by in the long run. And there are so many groups. um, When I first read about her, um, I think I I was on Twitter and I was... I saw other groups that during COVID have been basically doing this yeah. and how we've been completely abandoned by the U S government. And so you've got these, you know, especially uh, leaders that are women of color that are banding together for their communities um, and putting together and giving like, I mean, right now with the snowstorms that have cut out power everywhere um, there's people on Twitter that are like, this is how you survive without heat. This is what you're supposed to eat. This is what you, you know, like sharing that community advice. Um, I want to share this great quote. uh, That's Fannie Lou Hamer talking about food sovereignty. When you've got 400 quarts of greens and gumbo soup canned for the winter, nobody can push you around or tell you what to say or do. Just like that feeling of like knowing like I can take care of my own. Yeah. It's, It's incredible. Yeah, that's amazing. So, um... Definitely look her up, and we can uh, end today's podcast as a short, uh, curvy woman. I particularly love this quote, um, but it's going to make me cry. So, from Fannie Lou Hamer, If I fall, I will fall five feet four inches forward in the fight for freedom. Beautiful. Good night and good cluck. Bye, everybody. Pray, pray, pray.
Plessy.